I've never really loved the term side hustle. To me, the word hustle implies working your guts out, not having much of a life, not having a balance, not spending time with your family. And to me, the term side hustle has kind of been linked with that, but also something that you're doing on the side, like something that you're not really taking that seriously. But my perspective has changed on that somewhat. And that's in part thanks to the man that you are going to hear from today. A few months ago, I started listening to this podcast called The Side Hustle Show with Nick Loper. I don't recall exactly why I started listening, but for some reason, I think there was an episode that caught my interest and I listened in. That, along with recently talking to my friend John Teasley on how he started his laundry service business, working with my brother-in-law Tyson on flipping couches and him doing some side hustles, and then bringing other people on the show who started out with a side hustle and then grew that into a business, or it was just an additional source of income that helped their family. In fact, we recently hired a writer who writes as a quote-unquote side hustle, and doing so has really been a blessing to her family. So while my thing, if you will, is really all about starting and growing successful businesses, businesses with systems and processes that you can scale, that's what I love because it gives you freedom. I've also come to recognize that you got to start somewhere and not everybody is wired like me. And for a lot of people, starting their business means finding something that they can do on the side. And as I've listened to Nick Loper and his podcast, I've just been really impressed with him and his guests. In fact, we've had several of them on this show, but I've just been really impressed with him as a person. And he's just a wealth of knowledge. And I love the way he thinks. And the guy can talk for days about business ideas and side hustles and different things that you can do to make money. And that's absolutely something that I support, something that I back up. I feel like we're really in sync as far as the understanding and belief that anyone can start a business. There are so many different ideas out there, so many different things that you can do to make money. You don't have to have this big, crazy, change the world idea. You just got to see what other people are doing, find what works for you, and then take action on that thing. So I was super stoked just over a month ago when I reached out to Nick and he agreed to come on the Millionaire University podcast. However, since we've been in Bali, to say that my internet connection has been spotty would be a huge understatement. But we really wanted to get Nick on here. So I reached out to Brian and said, hey, how would you feel about interviewing Nick? Now, coincidentally, the way that I met Brian is from listening to him on Nick's podcast. So they already had that connection, and I figured it would be really cool to bring it full circle and have Brian now interview Nick on the Millionaire University podcast. So I really appreciate Brian stepping in big as a pinch hitter. And to be honest, him and Nick together hit it out of the park. Personally, I had a ton of takeaways and I have no doubt that you will as well. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, rise to your feet, put your hands together and give it up for the side hustle king, the one and only Nick Loper. Nick, let's kick it off with your favorite number one go-to side hustle or business idea that you can start now and grow into something that you want it to be. And we've got a whole bunch of ideas to run through, but my go-to, if I was starting over completely from scratch, would be an online content business. Because every time I hear that blogging is dead, blogging's been dead for 15 years, but I keep having examples come across my desk of somebody who started in 2020 or 2021, and they're like blowing this thing up. And so what I mean by this is, and maybe the term blog is not the right word. The days of blogging as a personal journal, yes, super dead. But (laughs) days of blogging is like building a destination site, building a library of content that helps people, that answers people's questions, that is somewhat evergreen, that can rank in search, that solves people's problems. That is still a super viable business model and one that I absolutely love because you're building cash flow on a monthly basis. Most of these sites are monetized through advertising and affiliate income, but you're also building equity should you want to sell it down the road. You're building this asset because these things will typically sell for three, four times annual earnings. And so if you're building an extra five grand a month, multiply that times a 
30x multiple. Oh, I just added 100 grand in equity or something to my business there. So really like that one. A couple of recent examples from the Side Hustle show. One was Shelly Marmer. She runs a site called TravelMexicoSolo.com. Started at the beginning of the pandemic. Kudos to you. I don't think starting a travel blog early 2020 would have been on my short list of ideas, but she went for it knowing that it was going to rebound and the demand was going to be there. And she's got a small portfolio of these different travel sites now, all geared around Mexico and was earning 50 grand a month from these sites that are only three years old because she went deep into keyword specific content. And some of the examples, maybe the high level keyword is like hotels in Tulum or something. And she's like, no, no, no. When you're starting out, you want to go like best hotels in Tulum for kids with a pool that allow pets for couples. Like the long tail variations of those is going to be less competitive and like higher search intent. Because if you're bringing your dog, you don't really care about the best hotels. I only want the specific ones that are going to allow me to bring my dog. And so I thought that was really, really interesting. That's like a deep dive. Like you said, on the long tail keywords and phrases, that's genius, right? That's putting a little bit of that elbow grease into areas that other people probably don't think to, right? And especially during the pandemic when travel basically just got totally annihilated. (laughs) Yeah, building up this library of, of resources. And it's kind of how I've started to think of the Side Hustle Nation you know, blog as well, where it started out kind of as this hybrid mix of, well, it's Monday, I got to have a blog post. And it's like, ah, you know, if you don't have anything to publish, if you don't have a reasonable method to expect people to find this, why are you forcing this out? Why are you cluttering up the internet with this stuff? Another fun example is a site called giftlab.co. This is run by Andrew Fiebert. And I met Andrew through a podcast of his called Listen Money Matters in the personal finance space. And he said, you know, personal finance, super expensive. But during the research for that, we stumbled upon these like gift keywords that nobody was really going after. Again, long tail search terms. He gave the example of like gift ideas for dolphin lovers. When at the time, nobody else had written this article by default. You know, I don't know what the search volume on it was, but enough. And we're going straight to page one on Google. And on top of that, super high buyer intent. So curating these random recommended gift list ideas, which to me as a person who sucks at shopping and is always struggling for gift ideas, that's a really helpful service for somebody shopping. It's like, oh shoot, that works, you know. But one thing that stood out from conversation with Andrew was like, you know, year one, we made zero. Year two, we made seven grand. Year two, we made 45 grand or something. And then it was exponential six figures after that. And so that's kind of the thing with these sites is you start to see this long, slow ramp up building period where if you need to make money quickly, go the freelancing route, go the agency route, go the consulting route like Brian did versus something that has a little potentially easier to scale in my mind, potentially easier to sell down the road, but does have this long, slow period of how do I do it? I ever going to see results from this? And I love those examples because they're so specific, so niche. The first example was traveling Mexico solo. You wouldn't think that there's a ton of people searching that, but there's enough people to give you a large audience that's going to make in 50 grand a month. I think a lot of people think you have to go really broad and you have to appeal whatever it is to a lot of people. But at the end of the day, you know, 100 people that are paying you good money, then you can have your tribe and you can do really well. And in terms of niche selection, this is always the question, do I go with an area of interest or expertise or passion? Or do I follow the data? Like, what does the keyword research tool say where I should go? And I think, I don't think you can ignore necessarily the keyword research and the level of entrenched competition. But what I've kind of swung towards lately is follow your curiosity. Follow your curiosity as a superpower. I mean, that's what's kept Side Hustle Nation going the last 10 years. It was super interesting in 2013 to point the mic at other people and just say, well, How'd you come up with that idea? How'd you get your first customers? How did you scale that thing? And it still is today, just the number of fascinating ideas that that come across the desk, you know, some built-in expertise and authority. Like you'll build it over time, but you gotta be curious and excited to learn more about that topic to really become a power player in that niche. Give the example of travel hacking. My wife and I love credit card rewards and points and miles like as much as the next guy, but we're never gonna be as in-depth as somebody who like lives and breathes that stuff and is taking these $25,000 lie flat bedroom suites on Emirates or something. That's just not where we're at in life. We're not going to be able to compete with that. So you got to find an area that you can't compete in. 
that's going to lead me right into the next one that I want to riff with you on. And of course, I'm going to be biased, but as another side hustle to start, developing a technical skill in marketing, tell us where you are on the list of that being a favorite thing for your crowd to look into. I think there's a ton of opportunity here. And where I would go, I mean, you went kind of like the paid ads route or do paid ads agency. And I think as long as you kind of specified, this is what we do, this is who we do it for. And you know, as long as you kind of differentiate on that, I think that makes a lot of sense. Some ideas that have come to mind, I came across this guy actually yesterday, the Twitter ghostwriter specialist. You don't want to manage your Twitter account, but you see the value of being present there and trying to write viral threads. And I thought that was a really interesting one. I don't know how much he charges, probably 500 bucks a month or more to come up with a thread a week or something. It could be based on your existing library of content. If somebody else already has that. Same thing for LinkedIn. We've seen people say, I will slice up your long form video and make compelling shorts for Instagram reels, for TikTok, for YouTube shorts. I think there's something there. Flat monthly fee, you know, set of deliverables. Eventually, you'll find somebody who's good at that skill and go outsource that and kind of build up your agency that way. Speaking from experience, that's what I did when I went directly into Facebook advertising. My little freelance boutique agency, whatever you want to call it, started as specifically lead generation using Facebook and Instagram ads for small businesses. And it was a technical skill that I developed, started as a side hustle, rolled it into an agency, took it full time. And now we are technically a full service agency delivering everything from Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, email marketing, all the way up to full technically offsite CMO, chief marketing officer services for businesses. It's something you can start really small. You can go develop that technical skill Take it to a few people, just one small local business to get you started. Maybe if they're only paying you 200 bucks a month, something that gets you going and gets you off on the right foot. And the cool thing about marketing, you already touched on this, is there are so many different avenues that you can go learn this technical skill or skills. You don't have to be limited to just one. The more you do, the harder it is. But there's everything from Facebook ads, Google ads, SEO, web design, graphic design, Twitter ads, Pinterest ads, organic posting, social media management, the list goes on. That could be a sub-thread of our own to this podcast is all the different areas of marketing that you can go acquire a technical skill and roll into a business idea that you can start today. And a lot of these could probably be AI-assisted in these days where the general public isn't aware or they're not power users of these different AI tools. But if you're doing the podcast show notes production service, I can get the transcript done for next to nothing. I can you know, use these different AI tools. I could spin up a productized show notes service, you know, something like this on a recurring basis. There may be ways to work a little bit smarter and not harder to free up some more time. So developing a marketing skill, side hustle number two. Nick, back to you for your number three, your favorite side hustle business idea you can start today. So this was a crazy story and it's you know, a productized web design service or recurring web design service. So I met this guy, Ryan Golgoski, and his business is called 180sites.com, which I think was based on his original price point of 180 bucks. We'll build you a website. And what was fascinating was he specialized on the power washing niche. And that was big enough to go out and build this business. When we recorded, he was about to hit a hundred thousand dollar month in this business because wow. he set it up as you know, recurring, I want to say for two years, it's 180 bucks to build the site. And then you also pay us 180 bucks for you know, hosting and maintenance. And so where a lot of developers are going to say, hey, you want to build the site, it's five grand up front. But for his customer base, power washing businesses that either don't have a site or they're just getting started, they're like, whoa, 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 five grand for web design. Okay, this is a more affordable, even though he may end up at that price point or more over the course of two years, it was a different reframe on how he positioned and sold it, I thought was really, really smart. So he's got this kind of recurring revenue stream with with also super low overhead because power washing site in this city versus power washing site in that city, they can rinse and recycle a handful of different templates. It's like not starting from scratch every time. So and it was really, really smart. Wow. I've never heard of that. That is genius. So essentially he he's breaking down that cost over you said two years? Yeah. His break-even point is you know a month and a half. It didn't cost him much at all to build these things. It was really, really cool. That's genius. I've never heard of that take on how you price out web design because four or five grand is base for a good website. There's plenty of people who do it for less, but depends on what your business needs or what your client needs. 
It is a lot, especially for a newer business. That's tough to swallow sometimes. So that's genius. I love that. One that I wanted to run past you. So number four on our list here, and this is just from me being biased. I love selling stuff on Facebook Marketplace. Same thing with Craigslist. I've never sold on Craigslist. I've bought on there. Where do you stand with selling items on Facebook? Go where the cash is already flowing. Go where the eyeballs are. They definitely are on Facebook Marketplace. Downside as a seller is like there's just a ton of tire kickers and even outright scam artists that you have to deal with. But I've made plenty of transactions over the last couple of years, especially when we were moving. I don't think it's going to fit in the truck. <laughs> Quick, go get rid of it. People would come by from Facebook to do that. One interesting one that I've come across in the last year or two that kind of specifically relies on Facebook Marketplace is this company called ShareTown. They are a reverse logistics provider for direct-to-consumer furniture and mattress brands. And what that means is, you know, how all the mattress brands have like, you know, the 100 night perfect sleep guarantee or money back. What happens when somebody says, it turns out I don't like it, I want to return it. They can't really take that mattress back. And so they either will donate it, but they have to arrange somebody to come pick it up. And that company is ShareTown. And so these local ShareTown reps come up, pick up the mattress from you, pick up the furniture or whatever you decided you didn't like. And then they go and resell it on Facebook Marketplace, and then they give a fee back to ShareTown, which passes some on back to the company, I assume. They take that margin on it. And what was fascinating was you don't have to pay for that inventory until it's sold. So it's kind of like this risk-free side hustle as long as you had the means to move and store these items until they sold. You connected with people making 3000 bucks a month, 4000 bucks a month or more doing this, either part-time or full-time. Wow, you know, obviously the higher population areas, there may be more opportunity there. I had never heard of it until a couple of years ago. How does this work? You know, it sounds kind of shady, but talking to people now is like, nope, this is a legit company solving a real problem and reintroducing these almost like new products back into the wild. Never heard of that. That's brilliant. I think it was Justin's brother-in-law for a while. He was flipping couches on Facebook Marketplace. So he'd go and find someone that's offloading a decent condition couch for Lord knows, twenty, fifty, hundred dollars, and he'd come, and I believe he'd refurbish them a little bit, patch them up, fix them up, clean them up, and flip them for whatever amount of profit he could get for them. So there's using Facebook Marketplace. If you just want to go out and test your luck and making a couple bucks, find some things in your home that you don't use or haven't used or won't use that are in decent condition, and just go flip them. And I know one thing this has benefited me as a marketer, but just writing good copy in the description rather than just putting the basics on there. That puts you leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else selling something on Marketplace. So all the information that someone could possibly ask and put a little bit of life into the description. When I do that, you know, I used to use it to practice my copywriting, see if I could sell stuff. And it would shoot me to the top. I would post something and it would get 10 hits within 10 minutes. And I like to think a lot of that was just the positioning in the copy, being able to put that into the Facebook Marketplace description of each item. Take the time to take some good pictures, you know, versus it's already in the garage because I'm not using it. And so I just take a picture of it sitting there in the garage versus staging it with actual good lighting and everything. Yep, clean it up a little bit. <laughs> you got to put on your marketing hat, if you're, especially if you're going to play the flipping game. How about number five? Back to you, Nick. What would number five be for you? Number five for me is a new one. It's the Amazon Influencer Program, which is super cool. So Amazon will let you upload short, you know, low production value product review videos of stuff that is available for sale on Amazon. And then they put them at the end of the image carousel under these product listing pages. Sometimes there's a manufacturer video and then it goes into customer videos. If somebody watches your video and then ultimately buys the thing, Amazon says, hey, thanks for helping us close that sale. Here's a couple percents of the purchase price. And what is cool about this is no additional marketing required. So I uploaded my first videos this spring and within a couple of days had my first $9. Okay, not a lot, but this is the easiest $9 I've ever made online. 15 plus years of testing stuff. The program, they don't say specifically how big of an influencer you need to be, but they do ask for Instagram stats or YouTube stats. You want some level of social following. They don't you know, specifically outline what level that needs to be at, but you do need to put that in your application. And I've uploaded 25, 30 videos. We were just making some more this weekend with the kids and their Legos and... 50 to 100 bucks a month on autopilot after that. Don't do anything afterwards. It just 
kind of go whether or not they choose to show it, whether or not somebody chooses to buy it. So it's super passive, super hands off, and doesn't require the production quality of a YouTube channel or something like that. But I don't expect it to last forever. And that's kind of the the downside of playing in somebody else's sandbox is Amazon has a, has a love-hate relationship with all their uh, affiliate partners. So they're crowdsourcing all this content and expect to probably pull commissions at some point. But for right now, get while the getting's good. They're just paying out commissions on if your video helps seal the deal. Yeah. I talked to a couple people earlier this year making a couple grand a month doing this, but they had hundreds of videos uploaded. And I was talking with another friend at a podcasters meetup. Yeah, I'm making a hundred bucks a month. You know, this is great. And she's like, whoa, 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 you know, how many videos do you have? 20, 25? <laughs> what are you doing? Why don't you have 200? Why don't you have 300? What do you do when you run out of stuff in your house to review? Like, I started by looking around my desk. Oh, I got the webcam. I got the mouse. I got the standing desk. I got the microphone boom arm. But at a certain point, you run out. She's like, no, no, no. Then I just go to my friend's house and start reviewing their stuff. Number six, I'm going to throw this one out there. This is going to be obvious. I want to hit it at some point today. Now's as good a time as any. So driving for Uber or Lyft, Uber Eats or DoorDash. Well, I think when people think of side hustle, this is probably the number one thing they think of. And obviously these businesses are not dead. What are your thoughts on driving for one of these companies or driving for the actual Uber for people or Ubers for food? Yeah, super low overhead, quick to get started, kind of a stopgap side hustle in a lot of ways where I need short-term income at a Lyft driver in Chicago. Hey, when I need to make money, I turn on the app. Downside here is what's your opportunity cost of what else you could be doing. If you don't need the cash in the near term, how could you be investing that time to build something that has a little more scale, has a little more staying power? Because there's a natural downward pressure on your earning power since it's a skill that just about everybody has. Those are kind of no-brainer ones, but there are opportunity costs that you got to consider when going into those. As always, still a good opportunity overall if you're just looking to make a couple bucks and get started with your business. All right, so number seven, throwing it back to you. What is your number seven favorite business idea? Seven for me is local column home services category. I would put power washing, window washing, gutter cleaning, mobile car detailing, you know, stuff like that where the you know, millennial homeowner is very used to an Amazon one-click prime shipping shopping experience. And a lot of the entrenched competition in this space is still operating for a previous generation where it's, you know, call us, fax us for a quote. If they have a website at all, sometimes they're not super easy to do business with. So opportunity to play in that space. Cooler is more and more people are just outsourcing this stuff. I think 20 years ago, the stat was, you know, 5% of homeowners had some sort of lawn care service. Everybody was just doing it themselves. And today it's like 30 or 40%. The pie just keeps getting bigger. So it's not necessarily about going out and conquesting market share from the people who've been in business for a long time. There are more people buying these types of services. And I think that spells an opportunity to come in and and carve out some space. And I love that one because my real first start in the entrepreneur game was way back when I was in middle school and I started my own lawn care business which consisted of me, my Toro, push mower, and blower and weed whacker. And I would mow basically the neighbors on my cul-de-sac, and I'd charge like $20. And as I got older, I bought out my neighbor's old John Deere tractor so I could do more land in less time. I brought on more clients, and it was great because I'd go out in the morning, make money mowing grass, and I'd play baseball at night. It was the dream. But it's something that's so easy, and if you have an outdoors bone in your body, It's something that can keep you outside. It'll keep you active. You're not sitting on your duff all day. It's fantastic. So I love that. There's so many different home services that people need time, help, and attention on. And even if you just want to focus on one of them, or if you're a handyman, jack of all trades, and you can kind of do the surface level stuff like placing a new toilet or unclogging a sink, mowing a lawn, tons of opportunities. So I love that one. That's a big one for me. We had a guy out to clean... uh to detail up my car before I sold it last winter. He put in the time, like it was not passive income by any means, but I was asking him, how many customers do you see in a day? And he's out here on a Saturday and he's like, well, you're my second. I got one more after this. This guy's going to make a thousand bucks today. And he didn't even have a website. Text me for availability. Nine Yelp reviews. That was his marketing. I guess this is the guy. That's the best word of mouth. You put your attention and time and effort into it. You can charge a tiny bit more, but you also get that word of mouth that this guy does it right. This gal does it right. They get the job done. It's beautiful work. And 
People are going to tell their friends and family about you. You can make a lot of money on a Saturday and Sunday. You could have a full-time Monday through Friday job, work, go out on the weekends and do some cool work like this and make a nice little spare payday. And a lot of these lend themselves to recurring services. Hey, I'll come back in three months or I'll come back in six months. You don't have to go build up this roster of recurring clients. I knew somebody who started a seven-figure cleaning business now and college graduate, and she was just kind of bored, didn't like her day job, and she just enjoys the art of cleaning, scrubbing and mopping and vacuuming. This is kind of nice for me. I can pop in my headphones, listen to podcasts all day. And she's like, screw it. I'm going to go turn this into a little business. So she started doing her family, her friends, her neighbors. And before long, she started getting more referrals. She eventually got a little website. She started her Google business profile, started getting reviews. And before long, she took off. She's got 10 teams doing tons of houses every week just from starting so small, just doing something that she liked. She liked passing the time doing it by cleaning. And now she's running a seven-figure business. That's really, really cool. Yep. I think the other thing to consider here is what industries are super, super fragmented where there's no dominant regional or national player for home cleaning, they can't have more than like a 2% market share. So it's super fragmented. So I think that's area of opportunity for sure. Absolutely. And these days, I feel like people more and more love to use the non-franchise option. If you're more of a local business or shop local type of mantra, and you have good rates and you do great work, I would much rather hire someone who's independent or an entrepreneur or bootstrapping themselves rather than paying the big franchise who is farming out the work to Lord knows who and charging you an arm and a leg for it. A lot of opportunity there. Number eight, I want to hear from you on virtual assistance. So VA services, is this something, not only because I'm curious with, I'm growing my agency and looking to hire more people in the fulfillment side or possibly VA side, but what are the opportunities like for being a virtual assistant? And is there a huge barrier of entry or not? Yeah, I think it used to be more taboo in a way. If I want to have somebody in my office, I just want to work with somebody remotely. So I'm going to hire a virtual assistant. Now, everybody works remote. Everybody works from home. So it's like, shoot, this has become super, super mainstream. It has been really commonplace for businesses to hire remotely, whether it's the typical virtual assistant tasks for administrative stuff, for you know, calendar management, appointments, at least in my case, running recurring reports, you know, spot checking different files, you know, doing these uploads, all the way up the skill chain to running ad campaigns, to writing blog content, writing email newsletters. It can really range, but definitely a big area of opportunity because just about any business in the world at some point is going to need an assistant. The old saying, you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. There's a huge, huge addressable market here. Just from being in the marketing area for the past five, six years now, I know that there's tons of opportunities. A lot of it is offshore, but there are plenty of people who, if you're based here in the U.S., that you want to have someone who's U.S.-based or you prefer someone that is in your time zone. That can be challenging for some people. Lots of opportunity, whether it's domestic or international, especially if you're looking to be a VA. If you have a particular skill, like if you love managing people and you find a business owner who needs help just handling their inbox, replying to emails, pinging the owner when they're needed, stuff like that. You can be a VA for five hours a month or you can be a full-time VA. There's a lot, a lot of opportunity for flexibility in that. And these VAs, obviously they're virtual. It's a work from home remote opportunity when you can get into that. Yes. A friend of mine said it was going to take four clients for her to not have to go back to her day job. That seems doable. It doesn't become super, super daunting to sell hundreds of different customers. No, if I just get four clients for a five hour package or a 10 hour package, then I'm good to go. All right. So that was number eight. Back to you for number nine. And number nine, super fun one, I'm going to call this unconventional rentals. So I was kind of indoctrinated growing up that you know a rental business is where you go buy three-bedroom, two-bath house in a nice working-class neighborhood and eventually buy several of those, and now you have passive cash flow on the difference between the rent and the mortgage. That was a rental business. I have since come across several entrepreneurs renting out stuff like bouncy houses, portable hot tubs, mobility scooters. And I just loving this idea of something I can buy once and then make money from it over and over and over again. <laughs> and the mobility scooter guy was really interesting. This was Lenny Tim in Southern California. What he did, which I thought was interesting, was you know he bought the domain, I think it was lamobilityscooters.com, like very specific, exact match type of domain. Put up the website, contact us for availability. As the site started to 
age into Google, like he started to get more and more inquiries, but he didn't go out and actually buy a scooter until he had a real critical mass of demand coming in. I validated this for almost no dollars. Okay, now I'll go out and buy my first scooter, and then my second scooter. I think he's got a fleet of five or six of these things and making a few thousand dollars a month doing it. And I had no idea this was a business, but we were just at Disneyland a couple of weeks ago. We saw tons of people on these little, you know, rental scooters going around. It's like, oh, this he serves you know, travelers and tourists coming to LA. It's like, yeah, makes total sense. Not something you can pack with you on the plane. So you got to get one while you're there. So he delivers to all the hotels in the area. And it was really eye-opening about a business with an asset with relatively low acquisition cost that you can make money, you break even on it really quick. And then everything after that's gravy. Yeah, that's genius. I love that. In a world where we're so subscription-based too, almost like rental, like when you have a Spotify subscription, you're kind of renting the music until you cancel that subscription and you don't get it anymore. What a great idea. The bike doesn't get used a ton. The golf clubs, the snowboard, uh, there's probably a few of these, but like catering to the travel and tourism market. There's companies that specialize in like baby stuff, rent a pack and play or car seats because the parents don't want to deal with packing that stuff. I'm going to hop in with number 10 here. I've always been interested in real estate. I live in my home. I don't own any real estate. Someday I want to be in that game. But is there an opportunity out there? I know there's some sort of company that has to be in existence that allows you to get into the real estate game on some sort of micro level and let you work your way up. There are a few that don't require the tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars for a down payment. One that I'm a part of on the commercial side is called Fundrise, which is fractional ownership of commercial real estate. And they have paid monthly dividends for you know eight plus years or something. I've been an investor there. And the other one is called Arrived Home or Arrived, maybe less diversified because I think you're just buying you know, a share of a single family house that they have vetted and cleaned up and rented out. There's some overhead involved on the company's part. And so maybe your yields are lower than what you would get doing it yourself, but it's totally hands-off. Just send you your share of the monthly cash flow every month with super low minimums. I think Fundrise is 10 bucks and Arrived is like 100 bucks versus thousands and thousands of dollars. So if you want to build a more diversified real estate portfolio, there's a couple options. Well, I'm going to look that up for myself because I think that's something if someone who's interested in real estate, but you don't have the means or the knowledge yet, there's a small way, a micro way to get involved. Right. And it's a portion of your portfolio, an inflation hedge, a little bit of a hedge against other volatility in the market. Of course, don't put all your eggs in one basket, do your own due diligence. But the downside is you can't take advantage of leverage because every you know, serious investor is like, well, yeah, but I can only buy one to one you know, shares of these things versus I could buy 5x the value if I'm only putting 20, you know, 20% down on an investment property. So you don't have the leverage, you don't necessarily have the tax advantages, although some of those do pass through to you as an investor, but it's not as direct as you would amassing your own uh, empire of doors, as they say. Well, I want to get to 15 here. So let's hop in with number 11. What is your next go-to number 11 business idea you can start today? SWAS, which is a software with a service. And this is piggybacking on the popularity of an existing software product, adding a consulting layer on top of that. We've seen people do this with SEO tools like SEMrush. We've seen people do this with you know, bookkeeping tools like QuickBooks. We've seen people do this with you know, CRM softwares like ActiveCampaign, like Infusionsoft or Keep, or even Salesforce at a higher level. One really cool episode we had was with Paul Miners, who was doing this with Asana back in the early days of Asana. An early adopter, early user, we started creating these YouTube videos of how to do blank in Asana, how to solve such and such problem in Asana. Keyword focused, he'd introduce himself, hey, I'm Paul, I'm an Asana consultant, and today we're going to talk about how to do blank in Asana, right? And over the course of publishing probably dozens of these videos, picking up views and traffic and all the good things that come with that, but also picking up consulting clients. We understand you're in New Zealand, but could you do this like remote training for our team on how to use this? <laughs> yes, I can. I'm happy to do that. So, you know, booking these multi thousand dollar remote consulting gigs as a, you know, just on the back of establishing his authority and expertise on this particular software tool. And the cool thing here, there's new software tools coming out all the time. So, you know, whatever you're a fan of, an early user of, I think there's definitely room to carve out some space there. That's genius. And we've, Googled how to do something, especially in the marketing or software space. 
and found just whoever popped up first. Their video had the most views and it was deemed by Google to be the most valuable. Those people have cleaned it up. I know there was one lady, I forget her name. I didn't know her. I just watched all her videos and taught myself how to use ManyChat back in the day. And after about a year of checking her videos out, it turns out she got hired by ManyChat to be their chief educator. I don't remember her name, but she's an example of someone who just started her own video blog showing people how to use ManyChat. She got so good at it that ManyChat called and said, hey, you need to come work for us and be our top educator. Lots of opportunity there. Number 12, I want to talk about bookkeeping, accounting, and or tax preparation. It seems like there's a ton of opportunity. I was just reading an article in the Wall Street Journal about how there's a shortage of good bookkeepers and CPAs, or just tax prep people. What do we got there? Oh, interesting. Again, if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. This bookkeeping role, somebody to look after the books is a really, really common first hire for a lot of businesses. And so there's that space to layer on top. Hey, you're probably already paying for QuickBooks. You're probably already paying for some bookkeeping software, but it's complicated. It's built for CPA. It's hard to learn how to use it as a business owner. And honestly, that's probably not where your time is best spent. I spent years longer than I should have in my Excel sheets. I was the weird person that liked it. Oh, better go log it in my spreadsheet. I could tell you up to the day, you know, the profit and loss of the business for the year. Not a great use of my time. Finally, getting some help on the bookkeeping front was long overdue. That's the opportunity there. Where I might go is choosing a niche of, I'm going to specialize in Amazon sellers or e-commerce store owners or specialize in pressure washing businesses or tutoring companies, whatever it is. But you're being able to carve out a space and say, I'm the go-to person for this type of business. Absolutely. So if you're someone who is more numbers oriented, organization, numbers, math, all that fun stuff, then booking is a fantastic opportunity because there's so much opportunity just in the small business where I know a ton of small business owners who just need help with bookkeeping and they can't find a good person to do it, can't find a good person to trust, can't find someone who's an expert in QuickBooks or Zero, whatever technology that the expert chooses to use. QuickBooks is the big one, obviously, but if you can hone your skills there, just pick up a few clients just managing their books, even if they're a really small business, tons of opportunity in bookkeeping. This was fascinating to me. This was selling spreadsheets. And again, I love businesses where you create something once, sell it over and over again. I met Emily McDermott, and I forget the name of her shop. I can go look it up, but selling spreadsheets on Etsy, like budget template planners, you know, personal finance things, expense tracking sheets. I was blown away by this. You know, give me a blank spreadsheet and I will make the crap out of the spreadsheet. It's like, well, some people don't really love doing it themselves and they'd be willing to pay for it. A pretty looking thing that's pre-created, that's already on the back of a, a proven process or something. Who was that workout? Like hard 75, like that workout thing that was like trendy for a while. Like I've seen people selling the tracking templates and stuff for these other things, like could you piggyback on a trend that's already happening? And so I, she had sold, I want to say like a couple hundred worth of spreadsheets, 5 to $15 a piece. It was fascinating to me. A super cool, low overhead, you know, cost you nothing to get started. Maybe even already have a handful of spreadsheets that you're using for various personal use or business use that you could repurpose, get those listed. She was primarily selling through Etsy, but had some creative ways of getting people onto her email list through some freebies and you know selling through her own website. People do that. You know, I'm always constantly blown away by the creative stuff that people come up with. So I'm going to swipe Etsy for number 14 because that's such a huge platform that I forgot about until now where you can take any particular skill you might have. It could be woodworking, it could be drawing, it could be spreadsheet building, anything like that. And Etsy is a great platform to put that on blast, right? The overhead cost is considerably lower compared to going out and building your own website or putting out your own e-commerce store. Is that right? Right. I think it'll cost you 20 cents per listing per quarter to throw something up there and see what kind of reaction it gets. We've seen some people doing well in the print on demand space there, which like everybody and their brother wants to have like a print on demand t-shirt business. So it's super saturated. And if you come up with a good idea that sells, odds are there's going to be a dozen copycats the next day. There's some pros and cons to that business. Disneyland was perfect for this. Like just reading what people have on their shirts. And you're like, oh, that's clever. Somebody bought a shirt that says that. Come up with these different ideas. Like, What would be the spinoff thing that I could make there? But the people who are having the most success with there for the sake of full disclosure have thousands of listings. So very much a volume game and then you're making five, 
10 bucks an order if you're lucky and 80 20 to everything where 20 percent of the products you create are going to account for 80 percent of the sales but still it can be pretty hands-off once it's up and running you just have to constantly be coming up with new designs to keep that passive engine flowing I've been a buyer on Etsy multiple times. You know, I'm a University of Dayton graduate and I love anything UD related. And there's a few Etsy sites, Etsy creators on there that they create artwork with buildings or landscapes from campus, things with the logo, things with the arena. And they have these cool little shops where they're probably turning out maybe a couple grand a month, but they did these pieces of art. They pertain to a very niche subgroup of people who are typically alumni of the university it's really cool items that people like me are suckers for because it's original and it's about my alma mater. So there's a lot of niche areas on Etsy that if you have a talent in art or design or whatever it might be, great place for you to cut out a niche for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to round it here with number 15. What is your final go-to business idea that you can start today? Well, I don't know if I fully qualify it as a business idea per se, but it is a fun way to make extra money. And that's participating in paid market research. And the first one that I did of these was some friends of I, we we were living in Atlanta and some woman approaches me in the parking lot of my condo complex. And she's like, do you want to get paid to drink beer? That's <laughs> that's your opening line. Yes. Yeah, yes, I do. It's my arm. <laughs> do, do you have other friends that would want to get paid to, to drink beer? <laughs> yeah, I can find some other friends for you. She's like, okay, cool, cool. We have this study going on. Next week, we'll pay you 75 bucks to come sample this beer that's coming out. You know, it was for Miller Chill, like before that was released. And so we went, you know, did this little sampler thing and get paid to do this. It's fascinating. And then we live near like a food testing lab where we lived in California. So we went and did a couple studies with them. I find it super interesting. And the fact that they pay you for this stuff is also really interesting. I've done a handful of these online too, where one of the recent ones, could you test our video editing software or screen share over the shoulder? We want to watch your workflow here. Or could you test out this investment platform, you know, pros, cons, what do you think before you would deposit your money here? And what's cool about these is they often pay 50 to 150 bucks an hour, you know, more for like a doctor, lawyer, like, you know, some really highly specialized expertise. Like if you're a hard person to get a hold of, like you can make a ton of money doing this stuff. But even for general population, I've seen some, you know, 50, 100 bucks an hour. I have a fun time with those. And I get lots of notes from Side Hustle Nation readers. They're like, dude, I just did my first study or dude, I made 300 bucks last month. And so those are always really gratifying to get. They're small, but they're easy to do and accomplish, and you can start compounding them. They start adding up over time. Nick, I think we found a perfect place to land the plane here. These are some great ideas for getting a side hustle going or business idea. Just get it off the ground. Now that you have some ideas, what's the first step that someone sitting here today who wants to start a business, what would you tell them to do? You got to think like a side hustle scientist. Adopt what I call the experimenter's mindset. And the reason for that is scientists in the lab, the test tube blows up in her face. It's just hypothesis disproved. It's not, I'm an abject failure. I'm never doing science again. And so I think if you can position your side hustle as such, it lessens the sting of the inevitable failures and setbacks and hurdles that you know, will come along the way. It gives yourself permission to try something out, to take a swing. And you might even say, I'm going to give this 30, 60, 90 days to see what kind of reaction it gets in the market, to see what kind of reaction I like. Do I enjoy doing this? You know, that's an important question to ask too, but to position it in your mind as an experiment, hugely, hugely valuable and super important. And something I still do today with pretty much every project. I use that at my agency all the time. I learned it from a mentor. It's T-A-F-O, test and find out. TAFO all the time. Nice. (laughs) Because when you're running ads, we're testing constantly. We're seeing what works, what doesn't work, what resonates, and what doesn't resonate. And you got to test it. You got to throw it out there. Done is better than perfect. Just put it out there, experiment with it, and see what you get. You never know. You might strike oil. Well, Nick, appreciate you coming on with us. You're a legend and a gentleman and a scholar. How can we find you? Where do I direct people? Is that SideHustleNation.com? That's the home base. SideHustleNation.com slash best is our updated list of what we'd call like best side hustles of the year. Probably a lot of them that we talked about today, plus a few extra. And of course, we'd love to have you tune in to the Side Hustle Show, wherever fine podcasts are sold. You'll find it there with the green cover art. If you hit hustle.show, because there's like 500 and 
80 something episodes in the archives. But if you hit hustle.show, answer a few short multiple choice questions, I'll build you a personalized playlist of episodes I think will be most impactful for you that you can add to your device. So hustle.show for that one. Brian, thanks so much for having me. This was a ton of fun. The hour flew by. It really did. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. And Millionaire University listeners, make sure you check out Nick. He is an awesome dude when it comes to getting your side hustle off the ground. Check out his website and be sure to listen to the Side Hustle Show. As a former guest on that podcast, I can tell you it is one of the best out there in the world. So Nick, thank you again. Always appreciate it. Cheers. Let's give it up for Nick Loper. I gotta say, Brian had some pretty good nuggets in there as well. Nicely done, guys. I had so many takeaways from this episode and so many aha moments that inspired me to do certain things even within the Millionaire University community. With that said, I have a really exciting announcement to make. You guys have heard us talk about creating more written content and hiring content creators, and that's something that we've been working on really hard here at MUHQ. As you know, today's episode was chock full of value bombs, resources, gold nuggets. And I'm super excited to let you know that we created a full-blown article out of this podcast alone. Like calling it show notes would not even begin to do it justice. So to go check that out and be able to review and get direct links to everything that was talked about today, go to millionaireuniversity.com slash blog and you can check out the article for this podcast as well as many others that we have finished and will be working on in the near future. Tara's been spending the last couple days working on an amazing episode all about making decisions in your business. So stay tuned for that episode next week. And in the meantime, get out there, take effective action where it counts. If you have yet to pick a business idea, go through the things we're talked about today and in past episodes of the Millionaire University podcast and pick something, zone in, and then start taking effective action today. Day by day, the small, simple things that add up over time will change your life forever. Until next time, this is Justin Williams, your Chief Money-Making Officer, signing off. Class dismissed.